And in this sense, I could also make this claim that um, transgender ideology could be viewed actually as a right wing ideology, not a left wing one. Now, of course, I'm always using these terms in the way I use it since the beginning of this lecture, which is just to stimulate a uh, cognitive process. I don't like to put people in categories. But to what extent transgender ideology is a right wing ideology? Well, it's predicated upon an exclusive extremist idealization of individualism. To some extent, you can make the exact same claim and obtain opposite results. Think about terms such as my body, my choice. In the United States currently, modern times, if you use my body, my choice in the context of reproductive health, usually then means that the person is overall uh, in support of free access to abortion measures. My body, my choice. You don't tell me what to do with my body. However, if we're talking about the recent pandemic, COVID-19, my body, my choice could mean a very different things. Don't tell me what vaccine I should or should not take because the body is mine. What I'm trying to say is this, science cannot be summed up in a um, bumper sticker or in a tweet okay, on Twitter. Science is much more complex. And if you don't have the decency to study at least all of these areas, so endocrinology, neurology, evolutionary biology, or, or any type of biology at this point, human growth and development, some basic element of etymology, historicity, historical criticism, uh, archaeology, anthropology, that you cannot make the claim that you know what you're talking about. You need to study more. Now, you might also make this say, okay, so it's, it's a right wing ideology because, because it's, it's, it's um, uh, individualistic. Well, that's really a dubious claim. Well, there are other elements as to why uh, you know, we might interpret transgender ideology as a right wing ideology. Another claim is that um, my understanding of the world should be the understanding of the world everywhere else. And this right wing as in it's a supremacist ideology. As in, if you think differently than me, despite the fact that science clearly doesn't agree with me, I'm sorry to say that, then you are a supremacist um, member of the hierarchy that wants to demolish the freedom I have to, uh, to speak up for myself. A classical example is the, again, we could see this from the right-wing perspective, going to a different culture and different country and claim that what we perceive as, I don't know, repressive as to traditionalists or the opposite has to be considered backwards, repressive, negative, and hateful because it doesn't align with the values we have here in the United States, for instance. There are plenty of examples here. One example that on top of my mind is thinking about the, um, I don't know, the, the, the shadow or the burqa, the, the, the veil that, you know, some, some culture, some ethno-religious group have, you know, traditional Catholics, uh, Muslims, etc. The, the veil that you, you put on. Um, and, and, and this would be a, a mis, misconstruction of what our values are. As if our values are the only values, and if people don't agree with our values, it means that they didn't quite get it. They're not as evolved as we are in the West. That would be a right-wing thing to say. On top of the fact that this extreme focus on myself as opposed to any type of um, societal norm is in itself right wing. If you can make a historical criticism is that certain ideologies on the left wing or perceived left wing political spectrum, such as socialism and communism, as the names imply, are focused on groupthink as a community, communist or society, socialism where you could make the argument that the individual is not as meaningful. And yet, in the context of transgender ideology, doesn't matter what the community says, unless it's a community that I artificially create to feed my ideals that are entirely subjective. So in this sense, transgender ideology could be viewed as a um, right-wing ideology. On top of that, you have a lot, a lot of other things that are entirely predicated on, on extreme and ethical capitalism, especially in the context of quote unquote unquote gender reassignment surgeries and the pharmacological interventions, starting with hormone therapy, that unfortunately 
are yet again an indication of the overpowering structure of big pharma, especially in the United States. But you don't have to go into the level of, I would say, Bohr's conspiracy theory to see how that is a problem. Now, of course, it doesn't matter whether we uh, identify transgender ideologies, left wing or right wing. The problem with ideologies is that they're not representative of the truth. So we're going back to gender. Okay? Let's start with a bit of, uh, how can I say, uh, overall etymological considerations, and then we will delve into that. Well, in terms of the word itself, it's really, really close to sex. Okay, And you might make the claim that, well, well, who cares about etymology? What matters is the way we use words nowadays. Fair enough. And I have a, an argument against that claim. First of all, this argument is, again, a false assumption, which is in itself predicated upon extreme left versus right political uh, understanding of reality, where overall, I'm making a big assumption here, overall, uh, left wingers, um, you can put, you know, it's a very big, big umbrella. We'll put in this context, um, progressive, okay, uh, political spectrum uh, is obsessed with the future, as the name implies, progress, where traditionalist conservatives, right wing, are obsessed about the past. What does it mean? Well, if you if you actually look at life as a real spectrum, as a circle, I would say the two extremes eventually meet, okay? Because what happens in the context of right-wing traditionalists, the, the logical fallacy is easy to determine. If you call yourself a traditionalist, well, at what point in time in the past you think we should attribute the quote-unquote golden era, the golden age of reality? Because you can always go further back in time. Example, if we're talking about gender issues, should we go back to 50 years ago, 70 years ago? Should we go back to the DSM-4, 3, 2, 1? Should we go back and look at um, um, homosexual behavior as opposed to orientation as a pathology? Should we go further back in time and find some dubious, to put it mildly, really anti-scientific and hateful uh, claims on uh, racial hierarchies, which we would love to think about as like this is thing of the past 150 years ago, um, uh, revolution age, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, but the truth is that in this country and many other countries, Europe, including in Scandinavia, which at least on paper looks like a very open minded, inclusive uh, culture, um, we have eugenic practices until the very recent time, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and so we have to be careful about looking at all those other things in the past. Those things are not relegated in the past. They could surface nowadays and it could surface tomorrow. Okay, what about, okay, maybe, maybe 150 years ago, it's not enough. We should really go back to at least 400, 500 years ago. All right, well, 400, 500 years ago, uh, you might still have only the three biggest American cities. Uh, so none of which are in the United States. So it doesn't mean that nothing happened in the United States uh, uh, is of any historical relevance. And the only country that, that has some relevance is the country where the biggest North American uh, city is, namely Mexico City and everything else doesn't matter. Well, we should go back to the Roman Empire. Maybe we should go back to, and so on and so forth. So the point is that you have to decide where you draw the line. Also, because the further back you go, the less knowledge you might have, to some extent, because the assumption that the history was written 4,000 years ago, it's less precise than the history was written 10 years ago. It's also a modernist assumption, a, an assumption predicated upon uh, misappropriation of uh, uh, enlightenment ideas. But the same issue is on the opposite side of the political spectrum, progressives, the idea that something is intrinsically good just because it is new. Example, computers, I would say. Now, without sounding uh, really um, uh, intolerant, backward, and obscurant, is there are a lot of things about computers and the internet that, of course, are beneficial to knowledge. But as I just mentioned, I can make this claim that overall, the current 
state of higher education, at least in the United States, it's much, much, much worse than it used to be before the internet. Now, I don't attribute the, to the internet or to the development of, of informatics and computer science a causal reason for what is the case, but you can make the claim that the more you rely on external memories, the less prone you are to remember things. The more you rely on typing things, the less prone you are to remember how to spell things. And by the way, there's plenty of research that clearly indicates that. Now, should we go back to Akkadian time and having our, you know, uh, piece of, of clay or wood upon to write? Maybe not all the time, but having some experience with calligraphy actually could make a huge difference. At least it will give you the chance to be more humble about the fact you have no clue whatsoever about what gender actually means. So gender, um, some etymology correlates and again there are intrinsically valid because you, you can monitor over time with some basic linguistics okay the fact that a term has been utilized since time immemorial it's not necessarily the only um measure of the validity of this term in other words just because something is old it doesn't make it true right or just because something is new it doesn't make it true either but the fact that there are similarities in the usage across time and space throughout culture gives us the, the general idea that this is very similar across time to a commonality of meaning, especially if we're talking about old etymology, I would say Indo-European etymology. And we could make the same claim for um, Ugrophenic uh, or Samoyed um, languages, you know, Tibetan languages, um, Semitic languages, and so on and so forth. So not something that's old, like 400 years old, because that's also a, a misconception, the fact that uh, something that's very, very old is less good in comparison to something that's slightly old. For instance, um, think about um, how uh, the, the very conceptualization of, of ethics switch over time, but we cannot claim that ethics is something that evolves either. Evolves as in changes, sure, but we could make the claim that in terms of the ethics of the 1930s in Germany, for instance, were definitely much, much inferior than the ethics of the Austro-Hungarian Empire for the first 500 years. So there's no evolution in that sense whatsoever. We don't seem to learn from that. And that's also a problem because we're we're mixing and matching some historical or historicity-based um, philosophical standpoints. Think about Marxism, near Marxism. And related elements, think about the Frankfurt School, think about uh, postmodernism, where in, in, in the former you have an extreme obsession with history as if history always tells us more as we knew less yesterday than we know today, or the opposite, that nothing is um, absolute and there's no truth to begin with. In any case, um, if you think about the term gender, sure, we could start from the grammar casus okay so the grammar equivalent of sex and you know you don't need to be a very uh, knowledgeable linguist to know that there are languages where you have no genders whatsoever languages that have two genders male and female uh, languages that have either a full or partial third gender it or is for instance in german or latin uh, languages that have singular plural and dual and many many others different ways to uh, count base 20 base 10 there's a a whole lot of variation and not always the expected sex of an object is reflective of the biological sex, especially in inanimated objects. You know, why does that to be just out, for instance? Or the fact in certain dialects, you can transfer the uh, grammar gender depending if you want to make the word sound more, I don't know, cute or little, or it's predicated upon the uh, localization geocultural element upon which the guy is based. Think about, in my case, from, from Tyrol, if you think about Tyrolean dialects, including South Tyrolean, which are related to Bavarian dialect, you can say, for instance, Mad, okay, um, for or, or even Metian in Central German. You know, you don't have to think of of of, uh, of a girl as in a female, grammarly speaking, gender, because you can use the neutral to convey exactly the same term. In any case, gender is in itself also related to genus, genus, gens, okay. So from, from one area, entirely biologically based, that is the etymology of gens or gens in, in Latin, okay? Which is kind of interesting because uh, <laughs> that is the etymology of gentile and gentle, because the assumption is that 
the Gentiles are the chosen one, which is actually the opposite from the perspective of, of biblical uh, knowledge or biblical, uh, let's say, historical interpretation where um, the, the, the Gentiles are, are the goyim, not the chosen ones, so to speak. But from the Latin perspective, since the gens has to do with the genius, the genetic, the generativity, the creation, the biology, the gens were the chosen one as in the families that belong to that, that part of Alba Longa, eventually Rome and the, the Lapium part of Italy. Uh, Gens is also related to the creativity as in creation itself. Think about uh, gunos, gynecology. Uh, think about uh, Slavic languages. So this is true throughout the, the, the level of, of uh, at least Indo-European languages. I can mention something about Sino-Tibetan and, um, and um, Semitic languages as well. Uh, but think about you know Bosnian or Russian Jena, for instance, for, for, for feminine and many, many others. So to completely separate gender from sex is simply an indication that um, you don't really know what are you talking about in this context. Now, does that mean that we should just say and use the words the way that are being used for the last 2000 years? Not necessarily, but A, if you do it, you have a very you need to have a very solid reason to change what the common use of the term has been for the last 2,000 years. You can just make stuff up, okay? You cannot make pronouns up because that's not how language evolves. It's nothing to do with the repressive hierarchy that wants to take away your right away. Again, sounds right wing. It has nothing to do with a manifestation of your identity as a way to fight against a world that doesn't want to accept uh, how you are. It simply has to do with the fact that things are predicated upon solid manifestation in reality. But anyway, if you can make this claim that uh, gender is completely unrelated to uh, to sex, we can find a common ground and say, well, how about we talk about gender identity rather than just gender or gender manifestation or all the above, gender behavior, gender um, perception, okay? Well, this will be not too different from a biological standpoint, and as you can see from a philosophical standpoint as well, then claiming that genotype and phenotype are not always the same. The external manifestation of something is not the same. And yet again, this is another proof that there is some element of um, right-wing perception in gender ideology. Now, I want to, to clarify things here. The reason why I keep insisting on the fact that transgender ideologies are right-wing ideology, it's not because I believe to be true. Ideologies are ideologies, and I don't really care if they're left or right, but I just want to clarify how many of these terms are usually used by the left political spectrum to defend transgender ideology without realizing that the thing they're very that they are defending is actually opposite to the values that they claim or they they think they are uh, defending. Okay, so um, if if it is true that um, you you can you can have a, a different version of, of of gender that is separated from sexuality then you can say that there is a difference between genotype and phenotype as it should. We talked about all the you know, DSDs and there's a difference throughout uh, medical knowledge. The, the way you appear, it's not necessarily the way your uh, genetic heritage is. Okay? Think about all the research on, on cardiovascular disease, for instance. But again, this is a problem that really is similar to certain traditionalist element that want men Again, male side to always look and behave a certain way, as opposed to women, again, female side to always be behave a certain way. So, in other words, you cannot be a man that doesn't fit the stereotypical, phenotypical, external aesthetic presentation, okay? Because otherwise, you're not a true man. So, you need to come out with a different term. This in itself is very repressive, it's very judgmental, it's very backwards if you think about that. So, many make this claim that if in other areas, uh, the research, the current research, because things can change, the current research seems to indicate quite clearly that things such as uh, homosexuality, um, so homosexual preference and predisposition is indeed genetically predisposed. So you're born that way. Uh, and there, there are a variety of, of, of um, uh, claims as to why that is the case. You know, for instance, different exposure to testosterone. Um, that means that, first of all, it's not just a question that you can change, but the fact that you cannot be expected to behave and look just like every other man, all right? 
For instance, I don't know, uh, think about having long hair. I used to have long hair when, when you know, my, <laughs> my hair still permitted it when I was in uh, high school and I used to play in heavy metal bands. Um, but think about, historically speaking, uh, barbarians, again, it's, it's a uh, endonym that's used to make fun, so to speak, of a lot of uh, uh, ethno-cultural group in Europe, but think of barbarian as in Germanic or Celtic tribes coming and, 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 and messing up with the Roman Empire, they tend to have long hair, uh, men, uh, biological, phenotypical, identity-based men, did that make them more of a woman or something in between in the eyes of the Romans? Of course not. And the Romans cut their hair because it was more uh, efficient in battle. Nobody could pull you from your hair and therefore it was more uh, effective. Other things that are completely not based in science is preference for color. Does blue have to do with masculinity and pink with femininity? Of course not. But there are things that are indeed, behaviorally speaking, just external manifestation of, of biology. For instance, men, as in boys, tend to prefer playing with cars playing with things, and uh, females, girls, tend to prefer playing with girls. But of course, there can be an overlapping element there. This does not create a third gender. It does not create a spectrum. It does not create anything but normal variation between the two genders and or the two sexes. One more thing we might want to say, just to be mindful of the time here. So, all right. But does this really mean that um, we, we understand that Expecting men to be only one way, women to be only one way, is repressive. And that's why claiming that something is a spectrum simply means removing the freedom of a man to behave and dress up as he would prefer and a woman to behave and dress up and many other elements, okay? I'm just making these two cases to, to, to simplify things, as she would prefer, okay? So this is entirely opposite to the claim of uh, tolerance and inclusion. But what, are, what about certain claims that, um, in this sense, the left side seems to have a much better understanding at first than the right wing side? In the end, it's not about politics, but we start this conversation by saying that it is wrong to claim that every person is either XX or XY, but it does not change the binary. What about claims that, well, there is a difference between a real quote unquote woman and let's say a trans woman or the opposite, that real man, it's different than a trans man. Yeah? Now, for the sake of time, I will not delve into all the different um, parts of the acronym and all the different manifestations. So I, I will put everything in the same basket. You know, please bear with me. This is a summary, right? And uh, some of, the, of these things are, are taken from etymology, from, from uh, biology, um, and from the intersection, not intersectionality, which is also a, a quite uh, dubious attempt to make things clearer in science, um, but intersection between uh, clear scientific biological data and proper cognitive theoretical interpretation. And this can, uh, in this sense, um, I'm no longer quoting the... the, the the, the works that I mentioned earlier, um, but um, perhaps uh, Bogardus will be one of the, the names that you, you might want to, to review. Uh, so if the question is, uh, should we consider trans women the same way as we consider women, if the consideration is predicated upon tolerance and understanding, of course, yes, full stop. We shouldn't discriminate if against anybody, if discrimination means any type of hate, hateful speech, hateful treatment, hateful uh, demeanor. Of course not. This is where the mistake is, though. We should not do this because there is an interesting difference in uh, ontological category, but because those are people, we should not hate anybody, period. In this sense, we're talking about true inclusion, true diversity. Creating artificial separation is simply false. It's an untruth and a very dangerous one because it would lead what would happen if you're going from praying the gay away, as we witnessed in the recent past, to trans the gay away, where a person is no longer able to exist the way he or she feels in connection with the body, but it has to abide by a certain type of ideology that wants to create an entire new category, which is contrary to the well-being of the person. Okay? 
Again, how do I know that person is mistaken? Because we can also see neurologically speaking in the activation of all this area that we mentioned, the fact that a person feels threatened by, for instance, society could mean that society is threatening, but based on our current understanding, it's much more sensible to think that it's an overarching activation of those very areas that we just mentioned, the bad nucleus of the stress terminalis, the, the amygdala, the hippocampus, the cortisol level that makes a person overactive, overreactive to things that otherwise should not be perceived as threatening, all right? So should we accept these people as, um, as, as in nurturing, inclusive, um, um, loving ways? Of course we should. It does not mean that we should go with their claims because those claims are not true. But most importantly, even more than true, you could say from the perspective of clinical intervention, they will not help them. And the fact that there is a mismatch between your identity and what you present could be a biological reason. And in that sense, there are completely different ways to interpret quote unquote unquote true sexual pseudodimorphism or partial dimorphism, including disorder sex development, which in the past was simply identified as transsexual. The fact that something exists that makes a person that way, as opposed to a facade, not facade in a negative sense, but the way a person manifests themselves outwardly. Um, and this, by the way, could also be viewed as a right-wing claim um, because this is something to do with the, the appeal to authority, the fact that you want to be on the quote-unquote right side of history. So I already mentioned the issue of, of, of projecting our values elsewhere, okay? And, um, and, and think about, um, uh, think about um, how we can apply racism, for instance, to to cultures that are outside of the spectrum of historical understanding example etymologically speaking most um italic most romance languages uh, will define the term black blackness with a compound etymologically based word that stands from nigger niger negro negro nero okay and you have niger you have nero um, but the idea that using that term in the United States, specifically in the Anglo-Saxon world, is racist, should be considered as such in this context. In other words, you can't really make a claim that if you use that N-word, you know, in, in, a, in a public university in the United States, you're really talking about the romance etymology of it. No, you have to be careful and respectful of the fact that certain things are triggering. But to assume the fact that the term itself is an absolute racist term really is in itself a racist claim because it makes every other language which is not really anglo-saxon in, in, in nature and not even that just english modern english um unable to use the very terms that are predicated upon their etymology by the way if you want to use the term black etymologically speaking black is actually related to white to bleach as, as in you can be burned like from from bleach for instance okay? and there's plenty of other uh example in in, in this sense um so um or, or the same thing to 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 claim that um when you talk about the i mentioned this before we talk about um the um prevalence of uh american culture and you don't want even to consider the, the three biggest American cities, so Sao Paulo in Brazil, Mexico City, Mexico, and Lima, Peru. Uh, I said, well, you know, and you don't even know that Mexico City is in North America. Well, you, you might want to not just study some biology, you want to study a little bit of um, etymology and just some basic geography that might be helpful. 